In the last video, I went over the famous D-type flip-flop. I want to make a quick correction on this slide from the last video for the SR latch. I have set and cue on the same side. When we use NOR gates in the SR latch, the sides actually swap, so cue's the bottom output and cue bar's the top output. What about the flip-flop? Well, this is correct, because the positive signal crosses once, then crosses back, so the cue output's on top. This is a flip-flop, so it's edge sensitive. On the positive edge of clock, the value on the D input is still internally and presented on the Q output. It doesn't matter what happens after that, the output stays the same until the next positive edge of clock. Now that I've told you the rule, I'll tell you about the exception to the rule. Some flip-flops have two more inputs called preset and clear. They act very much like set and reset, but I think they're actually labelled differently to avoid confusion with the set reset flip-flop. Preset and clear are often active low signals, so I'll call them preset bar and clear bar. This means the signals assert their action when they go low. Remember that the bar over the label is a shorthand for active low. When preset bar is high and clear is high, then the flip-flop acts as normal. On the positive edge of clock, D is latched through to Q. But when preset bar goes low, the Q output's forced to go high, and it doesn't actually matter what the previous state was or what's happening on clock and D. Similarly, when clear bar goes low, the Q output's forced to go low, and again, it doesn't matter what the previous state was or what's happening on the clock or D inputs. These are called asynchronous inputs, meaning that these signals have an effect on the output independent of the positive edge of clock. We'll come back to these later, particularly clear bar. In the last video, we looked at how we could connect four D-type flip-flops together and make a 4-bit ripple counter. We connect the Q-bar output of one flip-flop back to its own D-input, then on the positive edge of clock, the internal state of the flip-flop would change. One positive edge of clock changes the flip-flop from high to low, then on the next positive edge of clock, the flip-flop changes from low to high. This means it takes two positive edges of clock to generate one positive edge on Q-bar. If we connect this first Q-bar signal to the clock input of a second flip-flop, which also has its Q-bar output tied to its D input, from a frequency perspective, each flip-flop divides the clock by two. When we plotted this out, we saw the binary counting pattern appear. Now, I can actually connect more than four of these together. Historically, most mechanical clocks display 12 hours, so I want to be able to display 12 hours of time in binary. There is 60 minutes in an hour, and 12 hours in half a day, so that's 720 minutes in 12 hours. If I look up this table, I'll need 10 bits to display a number between 0 and 719, so I can make a 10-bit ripple counter. Just as a side note, when we draw schematic diagrams, we're strongly encouraged to set it out so that the inputs are on the left and the circuit progresses towards the right. After a while, you get used to reading schematics this way. Now, I only break this rule when there's a very good reason, but I think in this case, the smallest or least significant numbers on the right are the largest or most significant numbers on the left. Based on this, it makes sense to draw the flip-flops backwards with the inputs on the right with the signal propagating towards the left. This means our schematic diagram matches the way we naturally read binary numbers. So I can read this number 011101101110 as 256 plus 128 plus 64 plus 32 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2, which equals 494. But what time is this? Well, 8 times 60 is 480, plus 14 makes 494, so this can be interpreted as 14 minutes past 8 o'clock. Now, to be completely honest, I've been using binary for about 40 years now, and I still can't do this instantly. I need to work it out long form in my head, and that's not going to be useful as a clock. Instead, what I'm going to do is use a numbering system called binary coded decimal, or BCD. This is a mode hidden in the deep recesses of most computers, but here's how it works. We have our normal decimal number, 
and we use four bits for each digit. The ones column has four bits. The tens column has four bits. The one hundreds column has four bits. And the one thousands column has four bits. But what we do is we restrict the number of binary patterns that can appear. Of the 16 possible combinations for four bits, we're only allowed to use the first 10, which we label as 0 through 9. The last six are illegal. If even one of the four bit patterns representing a digit has an illegal pattern, then the whole number is illegal. From our previous example of 0, 01, 1110, 1110, well, this is an illegal number in BCD. So, how do we represent 814? Well, let's call it 0814. The leftmost digit is 0, so the first four bits are 0. The second digit's 8, which has a binary pattern of 1000. The third digit is 1, which has a binary pattern of 0001. And the last digit is 4, which is 0100 in binary. Overall, our number is 0000, If you set up the number so that you can easily spot the groupings of 4, with a little practice, it's much easier to read this number. I can read this as 814 without much effort. OK, so I have 16 bits. So now I'll need a 16 flip flop wide ripple counter. But I want the time to go from 0100 to 1259, like most digital clocks, so I know that the leftmost digit can only be either a 0 or a 1. I only need one bit to represent this so I can chop off three bits immediately, leaving only 13 flip-flops. There's actually another flip-flop I don't need. OK, well what about the tens of minutes digit? We know that this will only go between 0 and 5, because we have 0 to 59 minutes in an hour. Now, I only need three bits to represent the numbers 0 through 5, so I can actually get rid of this fourth flip-flop. I don't need it. Let's look at the ones of minutes first. We know that this digit goes from 0 to 9, but when we're at 9 and we receive a clock, we want the next digit to be binary 0, not binary 10. But the way we've set up the counter so far, it'll go through all possible binary combinations up to 15 before it goes back to 0. How can we fix that? Well, what we do is add some extra circuitry to detect when the output's 10, which is 1010 in binary, and clear all flip-flops back to 0. I can use a NAND gate for this. I haven't discussed NAND gates yet, but it's an AND gate with an inverted output. It's one of our name to input gates that we discussed earlier. When both inputs are 1, the intermediate output's 1, this is inverted, and the final output 0. For all other combination of inputs, the intermediate output 0, and the NAND gate output will be 1. Now, I'm going to introduce a clear bar signal on our flip-flops, which is active low, which is exactly what we need. When the ripple counter is at 9, and we receive a clock, the output will go to 10 or 1010 in binary. The inputs of the DAN gate are connected to Q2 and Q4. They'll both be 1, and the output of the NAND gate will be 0, which is connected to the clear bar input of the four flip-flops. And this will reset them all back to 0, which means we'll roll over from 9 to 0. Actually, our output will be 10 for a very short period of time, but it'll be too quick for us to see. Now, I don't actually need to clear all the bits in this case. Two of them will be 0 already. So, I just need to connect the output of the NAND gate to flip-flops 2 and 4. How do I connect in clear bar with these relays? Well, I've identified this 12 volt signal here as being clear bar but only when clock's high. Let's trace it through. If I disconnect the clear bar signal from 12 volts, it'll go low. This will feed through the relay contacts and turn off this relay in the flip-flop. This will in turn energize the relay immediately to its right. This will turn on the electricity flow and energize this relay. This will switch on and energize this relay. It'll turn on and in doing so, It'll cut power to this relay and it'll turn off. This will disconnect our Q2 output and it'll go low. 
This is to show how Clearbar works, but before I worry about the ones of minutes, let's look at the tens of minutes, which should be a little easier. This time, instead of detecting 10 and clearing the flip-flops, I want to detect 6 and clear all the flip-flops. 6 is 0110 in binary, so I can connect up another NAND gate to outputs Q6 and Q7, which will clear flip-flop 6 and 7. Now it turns out that if I clear flip-flop 6, this will actually toggle flip-flop 7, and its output will go to 0 without me doing anything. I haven't shown you how yet, but I can actually build any two input gate with two relays. More on that when I start to build the CPU. But here's my circuit for resetting Q6 and Q7. In the ripple counter, when Q7 goes high, Q6 should be low. This will turn on the relay on the left, but because Q6 is still low, nothing will happen. Then, on the second clock after that, Q6 goes high. This flows through the relay on the left and activates the relay on the right. As a result, 12 volts is removed from clear bar. This clears Q6, which in turn clocks Q7, and both Q6 and Q7 will go low. This turns off the relay on the left, which cuts power to the relay on the right, and 12 volts is restored to the clear bar signal for Q6. That's tens of minutes. Let me show you here. Very good. But now let's look at the ones of minutes digit, where I want to roll over from 9 to 0. This is the relay circuit I'm planning to use. This is very similar to the circuit before, but this time I assert clear bar for Q2 and Q4. Spot the error. Now it appears to be resetting to 4 instead of 0. Actually, this makes sense when you think about it. In fact, this is a good example of why we build prototypes. They can help us find holes in our logic. Clearing Q2 actually clocks Q3, just the same way as clearing Q6 clocks Q7, except this time, it's having an undesirable effect. OK, so what I'm going to do is remove the circuit to clear 4 and replace it with this. We detect 1010 and clear Q2. This toggles Q3 and our output becomes 1100. We detect this with a second NAND gate, which clears Q3, toggles Q4, which then toggles Q5. Here's the relay circuit that I've replaced it with. Now, let's see if we can count from 0 to 59, then reset back to 0. Excellent. That's when it's done. Next video, I'll look at hours. But for now, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.